I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Erica Schuyler. Dr. Schuyler is the Neurology Program Director at UConn Hartford Healthcare and Chair of the AAN Consortium of Neurology Program Directors. Dr. Schuyler, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Ariana. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for taking the time to join our first Zoom CNPD business meeting. First, I want to thank and recognize our AAN staff members, Lucy Persaud and Ariana Wegley, for their amazing hard work, dedication, and time they've spent working on putting together this virtual meeting, and for all the help with our many current initiatives and future CNPD offerings, which you'll hear about during this meeting. I also want to thank AAN leadership, as well as GES and education committees for their continuing, continuing support of our group. And of course, I'd like to thank this group. Um, thank you for being with us. The collegiality that exists between our programs, our program directors and our coordinators in neurology is special and essential. This group has been a huge source of support and mentorship that has undoubtedly helped to make this challenging role more manageable, especially now. I miss catching up with all of you in person and I miss meeting all of our new folks um, and look forward to meeting you next time we're in person. Even without our in-person networking and bonding that usually happens at our AN meeting, I hope that you can all take advantage of what we are trying to offer in terms of continuing to share ideas and wisdom in our CNPD Synapse and in our upcoming programming, which hopefully will include some more interactive sessions. Obviously, we all have our own story and struggles from the past three months of this pandemic, and I hope that you and your loved ones are all safe and well. I want to recognize the loss and grief that we are all collective, collectively suffering due to this horrible sickness and loss of so many human, human beings around the globe. In addition, our existing healthcare disparities have become even more glaring during this pandemic. And with current events, this is an opportunity to reflect on how we may be personally contributing to perpetuating racial injustice. We know we have to make changes for the better and do the work to dismantle racism in healthcare and in medical education. As educators and leaders, we have to. I know that lately we've all been trying to balance our various personal roles, our professional roles, and I'm sure that many of us have been anxious and stressed out about trying to best protect our residents' safety and well being. Now that hopefully things are getting back to our new yet more challenging normal, we're all all of a sudden, I feel like planning virtual graduations, figuring out how to orient and schedule new residents in a new environment with their PPE and their distancing. Um, we're hoping that our IMG residents will be able to start. Um, we're pulling our residents back onto our own services. We're trying to get them back into clinics and neurophysiology labs. At the same time, trying to figure out how to preserve what's, what we've developed over the past few months in terms of virtual didactics, telehealth, and shared teaching materials so that these can continue permanently. And now we're trying to figure out our next recruitment season. So hopefully in this hour and in the near future, um, I and we all can help to make some of these things easier for you. And I look forward to helping all of you to do that. So on that note, um, next slide. I'm going to introduce our panel members today. So we have our CNPD officers. So we have Dr. Farr from Wake Forest, who's our CNPD chair elect. We have Zach London, who's our CNPD past chair, and myself. We also have um, some speakers today, Dr. Jaffer Khan um, from Emory, who is the GES uh, chair, as well as Dr. Amar Bhatt from Rush. And of course, our staff members, Lucy Prasad, senior manager of our gradu graduate education, and Ariana Wegley, our graduate education coordinator. Um, next, I'd like to briefly make you aware of the AN website's COVID-19 Neurology Resource Center, the resources and webinars that are available via these links, um, especially many of the webinars which have been pre-recorded, have been really incredibly useful. Uh, next slide. Next, I am truly honored to announce the recipients of this year's Program Director Recognition Awards. Um, both of our award re recipients are amazing neurology educators and leaders who are truly deserving. First, we have Dr. Gori Pawar from West Virginia University. Congratulations to you. Yeah. 
Thank you. It's an, it's an honor to receive this award. Um, it's very gratifying uh, that the nomination actually came from my residents. So I would like to thank all my residents, the graduates of the program, uh, my peers, my mentors, many of whom are in the CNPD group, uh, my husband, my three sons, who have always been extremely supportive of my interest and given me sound, um, honest advice when I've needed it. And last but not least, the AN staff, many of whom with I've worked with over multiple uh, committees over years and who are always willing to help. So I would like to thank you all and please stay safe. All right, great. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. It's really been a pleasure to, to work with you over the last few years. We've worked on several Thank committees you. and stuff together. You're really very deserving of this. Um, and next we have D Dr. Joel Shankar from University of Missouri. Um, congratulations to you as well. Thanks so much. Um, I uh, also like uh, Dr. Pilar, I appreciate the, the opportunity to have an award like this because it is nominated by the residents. And I'm grateful that the Academy recognizes the importance of education and supports us in that regard. I'm grateful I'm in a department that uh, puts a high value on that as well. It's nice in a meeting like this to be able to speak to other kindred spirits. We all like education. We all like mentorship. And I was reflecting when um, I got this uh, about how much I like education and teaching and mentoring. And it's been true my whole life and I've never quite been sure why. And when my residents uh, shared with me this happy news, I realized that what, what really I think drives me is the opportunity to care about other people. You know, what we really want in this life is to have someone to care about. It's nice to get rewards and it's nice to be cared about and receive that, but it doesn't matter unless the people that you get that from are people you care about. And I think that part of why I like being a program director and working with residents is it's a very intense way to get to know people and really get invested in their lives. They come to us, they are vulnerable, they make mistakes, they're yearning and trying to get better. We get this with patient care, we get this in other ways, but it's never quite as the same and as special. So I really appreciate the opportunity to work with residents and I appreciate that this group supports us in this way. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you and congratulations to you both. I have the honor of presenting the Program Coordinator Recognition Award recipients. Um, please join me in congratulating Deborah Fay from the University of Vermont and Nancy Montgomery from Brook Army Medical Center. Um, Nancy was not able to attend the meeting today, but she did submit a statement that I will share on her behalf. Um, from Nancy, I wish to express gratitude to the AAN for honoring me with the Program Coordinator Recognition Award. I'd like to thank my residents for submitting the nomination for this award and program leadership for their endorsement and continuing guidance and support in my career development. Deborah, congratulations to both you and Nancy. Um, if you'd like to say a few words yourself. Yes, I just wanna say that it's an honor to receive this award and I, I am very much appreciative of my residents and program directors for nominating me. Um, they make my job both joyful and fulfilling, and um, I'm honored to be their coordinator. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, I'm Zach London, and thanks, Emily, and congratulations to all the other award winners. Uh, it's my pleasure to get to present the Frank A. Rubino Award for Excellence in Clinical Neurology Teaching. Uh, this is a competitive AAN award that is given for excellence in clinical acumen, clinical judgment, professionalism, and patient caregiver communication and education. And I'm pleased to announce that this year's winner is Dr. Ann Poncelet at UC San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Poncelet was also not able to join today, but she provided a statement which I will read to you. She said this, I'm deeply grateful to the exemplary clinician educators and my learners who continuously challenge me to grow as a teacher and physician. I'm indebted to my patients who generously co-teach clinical skills and compassionate care. 
So please join me in congratulating Dr. Ponsley and the other award winners for this remarkable achievement. All right, congratulations to all of our award recipients. Um, so next, before we delve into more detail um, about two of the issues that we're gonna be talking about today, uh, the fellowship timeline and virtual recruitment, I'd like to bring to your attention some key updates. Um, I know that you probably are aware of most of these things, if not all, but just in case any of them have gotten lost in the hundreds of daily urgent emails or you forget to read any of the handouts that came with the agenda, I just wanted to highlight a few things. Uh, next slide. Um, the ABPN, um, as you probably know, um, is accepting uh, virtual uh, CSEs and you can log those into the pre-cert credentialing system. Um, so in case any of your graduating residents put some of those off, um, doing the exams virtually is an option. The next slide. A couple updates. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard about USMLE switching to pass-fail score reporting for step one. Um, this policy will take effect no earlier than January 2022, and further details will be sent to us at some point. And more recently, um, the announcement that step two CS is going to be suspending uh, for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so there are downstream ramifications of that um, in regards to graduation requirements um, and also ECFMG certification uh, for both our US and, and uh, foreign IM, IMG. So um, we're gonna be getting some uh, further updates about that. Next slide. Also the milestones, um, the, there's some flexibility this year we it's optional in terms of whether or not we need to we don't have to report our milestones uh, for the second half of this academic year we do need to be completing them for our graduating uh, residents and fellows uh, even though uh, they are not being reported to the acgme so just um, to save yourself a little work um, also the ARS residency timeline for recruitment um, the date is pushed back a bit um, it will be October 21st that residency programs may begin reviewing applications and that the MSPEs will be released to residency programs. Next slide. All right, on that note, I'm going to turn the floor over to Zach, who's the leader of the Fellowship Application Reform Workgroup. Thanks, Erica. So yeah, I'd like to update you about our mutual path towards refining our fellowship application cycle. Um, as you know, the Neurology Fellowship application cycle varies a lot between different specialties. You know, we have some that have a match and some that don't, some that start recruitment at the beginning of PGY4 year and others that, you know, start interviewing people basically at the beginning of PGY3 year. And by the way, for simplicity's sake, when I say PGY3, I'm referring to PGY3 adult and PGY4 for, for child or, or NDD. Um, this is very hard on our residents that the application cycle is so early. Uh, I think everybody on this call knows that. Obligating them to apply for fellowships in the first half of their PGY3 year does not provide them adequate time to explore a lot of different specialties and make informed career decisions. Um, in some of our programs, the first year is mostly inpatient, so they don't really get a lot of exposure to a lot of what neurology has to offer until they are PGY3 or, or further along. And then to make matters even more complex, it's not uncommon during interviews for people to be offered a position and told they only have a short period of time to, uh, to accept that position. I've heard uh, 48 hours uh, as long, uh, or as short as 48 hours, sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks, but it certainly wouldn't give them enough time to complete all the interviews they might be considering. And in the 2017 resident and program director surveys, we, we learned that this was a problem for the residents and something that program directors also felt uh, that the application cycle was, and, and here's my joke that I've been preparing for all year, uh, it was myopathic. Now that is for the EMG nerds out there, you know what that means. Early recruitment. Recruitment is too early. So residents and PDs favored moving the application cycle later. Um, and this year, I think it's even uh, potentially exacerbated by the fact that a lot of our residents have been pulled to other services or that um, our clinical services, our outpatient services have slowed to a trickle during the pandemic, right during the time when many of them would finally have an opportunity to explore those things. And so uh, in response to all of this, of course, even before the pandemic, um, the AN sought uh, feedback from you um, 
there was a, uh, a an informal survey of program directors and fellowship directors and um, the graduate education subcommittee working through the AAN and the education committee were trying to develop a solution for this and so this culminated in the AAN releasing a position statement in February of 2020 that was signed by then president Ralph Sacco that encouraged uh, all neurology fellowships to work towards a uniform timeline that would uh, have an application no earlier than March 1st of PGY3 for adult residents, PGY4 for child, and no offers being made until August 1st of PGY4. Um, that would give enough time for people to apply, give enough time for people to ruminate about their decisions before having to make one. So this position statement was sent out to members and member organizations um, and subspecialty organizations for feedback. And the vast majority of the respondents were in favor of this, but some subspecialties felt it was not going to be as practical for them for various um, specialty specific reasons. And to follow up on this, um, let's go ahead and uh, take next slide here. Um, the, so I talked about the position statement. We, decided to move forward with this recommendation by piloting an initiative with three specialty fellowships. Rather than trying to bite this all off at once, uh, the work group decided to pilot this with neuromuscular movement disorders and headache. So in April, um, fellowship directors in those three fields, as well as all program directors and chairs, received a letter um, signed by Jim Stevens, president of the AAN, asking them to commit to a universal timeline. Um, using the uh, the one the dates recommended before, March 1st for, for interviews or applications, August 1st for offers. And uh, that would apply this year if and only if we could get 85% of the fellowship programs in their specific subspecialty to agree to participate. Programs were asked to respond by their uh, to this commitment by the end of May, um, the date of which has now passed. And the letter stated that if and when we got to more than 85% of fellowship programs, um, the agreement would be binding and the AN would explicitly state to all applicants, meaning essentially emailing all residents and program and fellowship directors with a list of which programs had agreed to participate and which ones hadn't. The letter also stated that there would be an opportunity for trainees to report anonymously if there were any violations. So um, the response to that letter I wanted to share with you. So. Um, First of all, with movement disorders, they are all in a match. The match fits the AN timeline. So essentially, everyone who is participating in the match um, has agreed to participate in the timeline. So that one was low hanging fruit. We didn't have quite as much luck with headache and neuromuscular. Um, with headache of the 43 programs, there was only a 74% response rate. So obviously can't get to 85%. Um, the majority of the responses, all but I think three said yes. Um, but still did not reach 85%. And then in neuromuscular of the 51 programs, there was an 86% response rate and 78% um, said yes. And the, uh, the other responders mostly fell into two categories. So I would say, first of all, with regards to neuromuscular, um, and bear with me here, and I'll explain why this is important in a minute. There was a formal response from, <clears throat> from the AANEM, so the subspecialty organization for neuromuscular, and then there was a separate response from sort of a minority, a significant minority of fellowship directors. Both of these responses, I think, expressed some very um, uh, legitimate concerns, strong support for the proposed timeline or, or at least a modified timeline, um, but concerns about both the process uh, and plan for implementation. I think a common concern was the 85%. Some said, well, that's too low. If we're not gonna get 100%, why should we do this? That means that 15% you know, of programs can go in and scoop all the best candidates. And I think that uh, was one of the main concerns. Plus, I think there was interest in more detail about how participation would be enforced, which um, those details were not uh, included probably with the level of granularity in the letter from the AN that some would have liked. So next slide here. Um, why am I telling you all this? So I think this informs our next steps. We're really grateful for the feedback we've received. And I know I spoke with a lot of you personally about this. And overall, we're really encouraged by the enthusiasm of our constituents for a standardized timeline. Um, we've put together a formal plan now for neuromuscular, and we're hoping to adopt this for headache too. And I wanna explain how this is going to work because I'm gonna need your help um, in giving us feedback about this process and, uh, and perhaps helping us to 
to help it move through. It's going to be a few steps. Um, within the next week, we're going to be sending out a survey to neuromuscular fellowship directors, asking them about barriers to adapting the new timeline, whether they're interested in pursuing a match, and a few other questions. And then we're gonna convene um, a discussion group shortly thereafter that will include representation from the AN, representation from uh, other fellowship programs at large, um, and the AANEM, as well as a fellow. And the purpose of this working group is going to take the feedback we get from the draft, uh, or sorry, and, and um, refine a draft proposal that will build on the AN's initiative, with uh, the idea being that we can take what we've started with but come up with a proposal that would be satisfactory to the people that were, were still waiting for more information or holding out. And the goal is to bring this back to the fellowship directors for feedback, um, for review and discussion, both by email and by webinar Q&A, with the goal of having a final deadline for late July, by which time programs will have to um, agree or disagree to participate. And our hope is then we can solidify this by August 1st so that um, if we do have the appropriate participation, we can actually implement it this academic year. This is an aggressive timeline, I, I recognize that. But I think we have one big advantage, which is that it is something that pretty much everyone seems to want, and we just have to come to a consensus about how to get there. Um, I really deeply appreciate the support of the working group and the people who are on this call. And I think I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be successful for this for this year, and hopefully we'll learn some lessons about um, how we can use what happened with these pilot programs to bring this to more fellowships starting next year. Um, I really very much appreciate your feedback. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put my email address in um, the, uh, the chat window, and if anybody has any questions, concerns, or suggestions, please feel free to email me at any time. I would very much value your feedback. Thanks. Great, thank you, Zach. I think um, we definitely have momentum. We've spent a lot of time um, talking with a lot of you as well as the fellowship directors. And I, you know, I think we all agree that this is the right thing to do, especially now. And um, I look forward to continuing to kind of push this forward and make it happen. Um, so next I'm going to talk about virtual recruitment. Um, many, many of you told us on your RSVP to this meeting that this was a topic that you wanted to discuss. Um, we've also received multiple requests and comments regarding putting together a consensus statement from neurology. Now, for background, I'm going to assume that most, if not all of you are familiar with the Coalition for Physician Accountability's work group regarding the uh, recruitment season that is upcoming for the medical student classes of 2021. Um, all of the major uh, stakeholders in terms of medical education organizations were included with representation in this work group and their recommendations included um, uh, recommending that all programs uh, limit away rotations unless that uh, particular rotation is not offered at an institution as well as recommended an all virtual recruitment season for residency in the upcoming season for all applicants. So um, next slide. Um, and many specialty organizations, in addition uh, to that work group, have also released specific responses um, that are all pretty much aligned with the, uh, the COPA recommendations. In addition, uh, many institutions and medical schools have already uh, mandated to follow these recommendations. Next slide. That being said, um, I'd like to uh, do a poll for the audience uh, to get a little bit more information from you. Um, the first question is, has your program already mandated virtual recruitment? Um, and the second question is, um, and I'm assuming that everybody who's from an institution who has already mandated it, that you would support consensus across the specialty in doing that. Um, and with that assumption, um, we're asking in the second question that for programs from institutions who have not yet mandated a virtual recruitment session, would you support and abide by a consensus statement from neurology to follow these recommendations? So 80% of uh, programs in terms of 
who was present at this meeting, have already mandated virtual recruitment. And for the programs uh, who are from institutions who have not yet mandated virtual recruitment season, would you support and abide by a consensus statement from neurology? So 96% um, say yes, 4% uh, say no. So um, that being said, um, we can go to the next slide. Now we already have started to work on a consensus statement and it's, it's being drafted right now and it's going through the editing process. Um, and it has the same overall goal as the COPA recommendations, which um, the goals are to minimize health risks um, and to provide an equitable structure for both applicants and programs. Um, some of the points that we're considering to include, and this is to give you a preview, um, but it is in sort of the drafting and editing process right now, um, include um, some of the points you see listed below which are um, in general in alignment with the COPA recommendations, but also including some points about um, diversity and inclusion, as well as a holistic application review. So those are some of the things we're working on right now um, in terms of uh, consideration for including in our consensus statement. Um, next slide. As a next step, um, and I imagine that um, we'll have the statement uh, drafted pretty soon and ready for review, and at that point, we will uh, circulate it for review to, um, our, to the three consortia, the, of the neurology program directors, clerkship directors, and education coordinators. All right. Now, also to help address some of the um, issues with virtual recruitment and what resources do we need, um, there are some resources already available on the AMC website, um, and we have developed um, a work group that has just been formed to work on virtual recruitment. Um, and that work group is really aimed towards residency and fellowship program leaders, faculty, and coordinators to provide resources and support regarding the upcoming uh, recruitment season. There's also a UES uh, tele-interview work group um, working on addressing needs of, of applicants and uh, medical students. And we plan on, on having this work group collaborate with that work group with the goal of developing program resources that are addressing the needs of the applicants. Um, there's also a teleneurology education needs for residents work group that um, is also um, newly formed. So on that note, I'm going to turn over the floor to Dr. Khan, who's going to uh, update you on what GES is up to. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Erica, for having me um, speak to the CNPD as a whole. I'm Joffer, I'm chair of the Graduate Education Subcommittee. We have a lot of things going on and I just wanted to hit a few highlights for you. Um, wanna consider uh, the activities we used to engage in on an annual basis for our program directors, our programs, our coordinators, one of which was the trainee reception that we held on the first Monday after, well, the Monday after the first weekend of the Academy meeting. You, those of you who attended it, I know, remembered it well. It was a chance for us to showcase our programs within our departments across fellowships and residencies, as well as interact with future, hopefully future neurologists, hopefully future neurology trainees. It was a time for us to share our experiences with, with neurology in our careers to those that were considering training and then practicing in neurology. Very important uh, format for us. And what we've done recently is we're going to now produce a virtual poster hall, if you will, that will allow all of our departments to host a um, virtual hall to, again, showcase our training programs across residencies and fellowships. There'll be one submission per institution or, or department available to all of you and it will run for about 10 months out of the year, even through the recruitment season. So we'll take something that was only run over a two to three hour period and actually have it 24 seven for up to 10 months. You'll hear more about this very soon. We hope to kick it off within the next couple of weeks. The current pandemic has provided many, many opportunities to, for us to get very creative. And in fact, many of our colleagues across the country have been very creative and innovative, and not just for their own program, but rather for our entire GME community in neurology and its subspecialties. Some of these folks who have created 
serial conferences, even daily conferences, trivia games for uh, national attendance have contacted our academy and asked if they could donate, so to speak, their idea to the academy and have the, the, the academy administrate some of these programs. These include a game night with trivia, noon conferences, which exist now, but however, there's no limit. These can be conferences that are run at any time, any day, and even recorded for future use for asynchronous learning and distribution. And so we are now engaged, engaged in conversations to figure out how to do this. I do think it's going to be something that's highly valued across uh, all of our programs, trainees, and even practicing neurologists. I'm gonna skip forward to the uh, International Medical Graduate Manuscript that a few of us have put together and have been supported by the um, Graduate Education Subcommittee as well as our Education Committee. That manuscript is a description of the impact that international graduates uh, have on our training programs as well as the practice of neurology within the United States. Uh, this, this right now, the, our, from our standpoint, the manuscript has been finalized. It's sitting at a board level for approval with the American Academy of Neurology, and if approved, hopefully will go on for submission for hopeful publication in the near future. Lastly, I want, I'm very pleased to announce that we now have put together a consortium, yet another acronym that you have to repeat, repeat multiple times in order to get to roll off your tongue, but it is the CNEC the Consortium of Neurology Education Coordinators. This, this includes clerkship coordinators as well as program coordinators and fellowship coordinators. The consortium has been solidified. We're gonna hold elections for their officers soon. We're going to put together a similar format to this, the CNPD. We're gonna have the CNEC business meeting. And then also one thing that's come about already is the enthusiasm of our coordinators. They are already coming together to consider projects and have actually produced some resources for our programs. And so we're gonna be turning to you in the near future to partner or collaborate with our coordinators as program directors to further um, strengthen the resources and then have them ready for distribution for use as a teaching tool, um, as a guidance for rotations and, and many other purposes. And in addition to, to all of that, we've got many other activities that are ongoing and I'm not gonna leave it with the, what we have, but I just want you to know that our graduate education subcommittee has been extremely active and continues to be so. Thank you. Thank you, Joffer. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on um, from GES, so I'm looking forward to that trivia night too. I think that'll be that'll be really fun. So next, uh, Dr. Bott will be updating all of you on some important new uh, curriculum resources that we have available for residents. Uh, thanks, Erica. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Schneider couldn't join us today, so I'm just going to briefly summarize the work we've done with the psychiatry curriculum and the sleep medicine curriculum for neurology residents. We just wanted to thank the GES and CNPD for allowing us to help put this together with our both of our work groups, which have just been really supportive and fantastic. And we really were able to collaborate with program directors across the country, not just in neurology, but of course in psychiatry and have contact, content experts from psychiatry and sleep medicine to develop both of these for neurology residents. Uh, so the psychiatry curriculum really uh, is, is designed to provide a comprehensive outline for trainees in neurology, for program directors in neurology, and potentially even for program directors in psychiatry who are developing rotations, evaluations, and uh, lectures or didactics for neurology residents. So it's really tries to touch on all of those aspects and really build on the milestones that have already been developed by the ACGME to help our program directors and trainees work through their entire residency to, to appropriately learn what we felt a neurologist needs to learn about psychiatry and sleep medicine. Uh, so I'll just also briefly uh, share some comments from Dr. Schneider, uh, who can join us today. So uh, regarding the sleep medicine curriculum, uh, he and his work group worked within a suggested template that appropriately captures the breadth of the subspecialty. And it is helpful in ensuring the uniformity and usability of core, cur core curricula across subspecialties. And they recognize the need for utility, meaning how does one evaluate the implementation of such a curriculum? 
and practicality, knowing that residents need exposure, but the goal is not to come out a subspecialist. So uh, Dr. Schneider and his group added measurable objectives in each of the major core curriculum areas to help program directors and co coordinators define what is reasonable uh, for a neurology resident to know coming out of such an elective and in what ways that might be measured. And also given the cross subspecialty nature of sleep medicine, akin to many neuro neurological subspecialties, uh, they included a table highlighting sleep disorders that may impact various other neurology subspecialties. Uh, they hope this will be helpful uh, this will hopefully be complemented by a small contribution of sleep issues to be added to other subspecialty core curricula if they wish to incorporate those principles of sleep evaluation and management into their core curricula. And I think this is really one way that these curricula can help in other subspecialty areas within neurology because the purpose is to support the trainees, the program directors and coordinators in developing lectures, developing rotations, developing evaluations, and measuring them in a way that is in line with ACGME's milestones, but also very practical and within the scope of what a neurology resident needs to learn about any subspecialty. So thank you for that. And thank you for giving us this opportunity to develop this. And thank you to our work groups for, even though they're not here to speak for themselves, it was a lot of back and forth and fantastic work together. All right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan and Dr. Bott for those updates. Um, I think um, especially um, the psychiatry curriculum, I agree, it just really there was a lot of collaboration across um, you know, many experts um, and there, were, there was a lot of interest in sort of cross-pollination and networking between um, ADPERT, which is the organization of uh, psychiatry program directors, um, as well as our group. So I think um, there's definitely potential for further collaboration um, you know, so look, always looking for, for interested parties to help develop resources. So um, next, I just wanted to just share some of the feedback that all of you provided. Um, when you received your, in, your invitation to attend this meeting, there was a Google form and we um, received a lot of responses. I think it was around 190 responses. And um, we asked you all about um, if you could share a current or planned innovation related to current needs within medical education due to COVID-19. We also asked you about what topics you'd like to hear about in the future, um, and as well as at this CNPD webinar, and how can the AAN support or assist GME constituents? So um, the next couple of slides are just um, a summary of some of the more common answers. So next slide. Um, these were some of the um, innovations that we saw um, listed, that many of you listed. Um, and next slide. Um, some of the ideas for topics for future CNPD webinars. Um, and this is something that we are interested in your feedback still. So if you um, are interested in creating or being part of future presentations um, or have ideas or things that you feel strongly that need further discussion, uh, please email and, uh, and we will, um, so I wanted to reach out to all of you about that and we welcome your involvement. Uh, next slide. And uh, in terms of answers from all of you for ways that the AAN can support programs, um, these, were, these were some of the answers we received as well. And again, if you're interested in developing or being part of these presentations, then, uh, then please email. And um, it looks like we have a bit of time left uh, where we can, as, as panelists address some of your questions um, and topics for discussion. And um, if for some reason we're not able to address all questions, um, we will be able to uh, still review them and hopefully plan to address them when we have future webinars. This is not our only meeting and we look forward to planning um, additional um, topics and webinars for this group over the next couple of months. So, um, since the QA feature is not listed, um, we will be able to, if you raise your hand um, within Zoom, then we will be able to um, take you off of the, um, the mute so that you can ask questions. Okay, um, and I'm also, um, I can address a couple of the things that have come up so far in the chat. Um, one of which is, um, 
there have been a couple, um, and I have, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to follow them in, in presenting, but um, there have been several comments about IMGs. Um, and I totally agree that this is something that all of us are concerned about, um, and which we had in mind in, in, in writing the manuscript that, that Joffer mentioned. Um, in terms of you know, the upcoming um, start date, there are definitely concerns about whether or not our incoming residents will be able to get their J1 in time. And the ECFMG is really working hard on that. Um, I have uh, five of my incoming seven residents all are on J1 visa. And um, based on recommendations directly from the ECFMG, I've been writing letters on their behalf. I've been trying to push for them to get expedited um, embassy appointments. And, you know, I think we all just have our fingers crossed in terms of um, whether or not they're going to get here on time um, or, or later. And I think that we are going to see future impact as well in terms of travel restrictions, um, potentially, and um, potentially a decrease in our applicant pool, which is, you know, very pertinent to um, our program, seeing that between a fourth and a third of our trainees are uh, our IMGs. So I think um, I'd like to also point you to the handouts that were provided in the agenda. Um, Ellie Fitzpatrick from the ECFMG provided a slide set with a bunch of updates from their end in terms of what they're working on, uh, which includes alternative pathway for step two CS, which I think um, could be a big problem for, um, for IMGs wanting to apply who haven't yet taken it since that is a requirement for getting ECFMG certification. So I think a lot of these are really active and ongoing. Um, and I've been happy to see the, you know, the degree of um, support from the AMA and the ECFMG and other major organizations um, in terms of helping, um, you know, contact the State Department on behalf of our IMGs. So. Oh, Erica, there were some comments in the chat space about the interactive potential for the virtual poster session. And um, there was, I think, a response Jennifer sent back about how we're going to discuss that and take that back. So any word about when we'll be um, hearing more about those sort of virtual poster sessions, more details? Yeah, I'm think, curious. I think my answers only went to the panelists, so you may want to reiterate them. So the question was, will there be um, the possibility for interactive um, work through those virtual poster sessions for applicants in any way to interact with the programs? And um, are they limited only to one poster if there are both residency and fellowship offerings? I think those are both worth considering. This is Lucy. We're trying to just work through the specifics of what we're going to do for the virtual uh, training uh, poster sessions, rather. And so, um, yeah, all options that any ideas folks have, please send them my way. We're trying to still figure out the interactive part. So um, we're, we're looking for um, ideas. If you can send those, that'd be great. And as far as the number, sorry, um, of posters, really, the, the platform is a, it's a, um, as you know, it's electronic, obviously, but it's a PowerPoint essentially that you're uploading. So you're limited to about eight to 10 slides. Um, so just so you, you can use, utilize those slides to upload whatever information you'd like to share. And so, you know, if, you, if it's feasible that you think you can do all of that in one uh, PowerPoint, that'd be great. Uh, we are gonna have tags available so that folks can filter through um, to find the information that's being uh, presented. Okay, and I'm not able to see who has their hand raised, so. Um, yeah, Bradshaw Dr. does. Dr. Bradshaw, okay. yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you. Um, congrats to Gari and Joel, that's awesome. I just wanted to push a little bit on the, um, the problem with J-1 visas. You know, someone mentioned in the chat that a lot of um, community-based programs depend on IMGs not just community-based programs, many, many of, of uh, academic programs rely on uh, international medical graduates. And we have, let's see, we have nine incoming and originally almost all were at risk. And, and so for various reasons, it's down to maybe th three at risk of not making it. Um, 
we were told by our GM in the office that, the, that those who are applying from within the US have to go through the USCIS and they have a six to eight month backlog. Six to eight month backlog. And actually our GME office suggested that we start asking for <clears throat> um, deferrals. And so basically to be released from our match obligations, uh, potentially allowing those same people to start next year so that we could go out and find some people to fill in the empty slots, which, which I'm not willing to do. But I, I did put a question to the C, uh, CNPD listserv uh, you know, a few weeks ago saying, hey, am I the only one that's in this crisis and should we, you know, as program directors advocate uh, rather than individually as a group? It's getting even kind of late for that, I think, but I think many of us are impacted by this and potentially disastrously. So I'm just raising the possibility that, that we do something together. All right, thanks, Dr. Bradshaw. I think um, it definitely warrants further discussion. And I think um, sooner rather than later, um, especially if we're looking at a lot of our residents um, either not being able to start on time or potentially not being able to start at all um, to see what the next steps can be and brainstorming about how we can advocate for them. So thank you for your input about that. I don't see any other raised hands right now, Dr. Schuyler. I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions they'd like us to address. Oops, sorry, oh, Ellie Fitzpatrick has a question, one second. Go ahead, Ellie. Hi, um, yeah, this is Ellie Fitzpatrick from UCFMG. I just wanted to thank all of you um, to be included. Um, I, I am aware of this problem with USCIS. I know that um, a group of physicians have uh, written letters to the AMA, that the AMA and UCFMG has requested expedite for, uh, from USCIS. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, just again, since yesterday, there's been some action on this, but I reference um, my PowerPoint and make sure that you are contacting the J1 program at ECFMG. It's Tracy Wallowitz at ecfmg.org. Um, and please, you know, give her the information on your resident. Um, certainly the implication of travel, which is sometimes what physicians do, is, is going to be risky as well as, um, you know, waiting the six to eight months. So, um, I did hear that a number of residents were traveling to Mexico, which, you know, you know, not only gets into the risk of the corona issue, but also possible delays and denials upon reentry. So, um, you know, ECFMG is aware of it. I would definitely follow up with Tracy with the name of your specific residents. And then I'll be in touch with Erica as I learn anything more. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ellie, for, for joining our meeting today and also um, providing the slide set, which um, I encourage everybody to review, um, which is along with your agenda, um, as well as kind of um, planning next steps. Um, it looks like um, we have a, a question in the chat about um, which work groups we're forming and there might be opportunities to get involved. So I think um, just depending on what you're interested, we can use your help with any of it. So um, in terms of developing curriculum, if there's a certain area of expertise, um, if you're interested in helping um, work on working on putting together resources that would be useful for virtual recruitment, any of those things, any ideas that you have, please um, send an email to Lucy with your ideas. Um, and if you're willing to help with all or anything, um, let her know that as well too. And we're happy to have, um, we're happy to have your help. Okay. I'm not seeing any other hands being raised right now, Dr. Schuyler. Okay. All right, so um, if we don't have any other questions um, or any new business, um, we'll be able to wrap up the meeting. Um, I think, um, 
you know, if questions come up, you think of things later, please email. Um, if you're interested in helping, please email. Um, and we look forward to working with you. And I look forward to um, having more of these webinars on, on focused topics or um, on whatever, you know, our constituency feels that would be most useful to have additional presentations about. So um, thank you all for participating today. And thank you in advance to everybody wanting to volunteer. And I look forward to seeing all of you soon.